Hey everyone, it's Mark Bayer, and you are tuned to When Science Speaks. This episode of the show is sponsored by the One for the Week newsletter. One for the Week is a free weekly newsletter delivered to your inbox on Sundays, and you'll get one resource related to presentation skills, writing, or persuasion that you can apply right away to help you land your dream job, get buy-in for your ideas, or get promoted faster. Interested in getting these free tools in your inbox to help you achieve your goals? Just go to oneforTheWeek.com. That's O-N-E-F-O-R, the week.com to get the resources for moving up. I am so excited to have Monique Mills on the show today. I had the honor of being on Monique's podcast, which is just an awesome show. We're gonna we're gonna have a link to the show and also to the episode where we had this conversation previously. And we're gonna pick up on some of the themes that Monique and I talked about on the Unpolished MBA, which is Monique's show. Monique, thank you for being here. Wonderful to continue this dialogue. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So one of the things we focus on here on When Science Speaks is having people on the show as guests who are really strong scientists, engineers, and amazing communicators. As I often say, I have one of those two things, and it's not the science or engineering. And however, people like you are out there, sometimes the purple unicorn is out there. And I go looking for the purple unicorns who have really like both sides of the brain in overdrive at the same time, both scientific engineering STEM skills and also the ability to communicate them in engaging sensible ways to demonstrate their impact and their value with their most important stakeholders. And so you are one of those purple unicorns that I am so happy to talk to you right now. And of course, the first question for you, first the, the sort of hypothesis that I have after about 200 and almost 50 episodes of When Science Speaks, when I ask people like you who have both of these STEM and communication skills is how did this happen? And over the years, I have found that disproportionately, the answer there from these folks is they either were first in their family to go to college or graduate college, and or they are actually bilingual. So English may not have been their native language. They also speak another language. And that kind of makes sense to me. Both those things potentially make sense to me when I think about what's required to be a strong communicator, particularly for someone in the STEM field. But we talked about on your show that, yes, spoiler alert, you do fall into one of those two categories. And I would love for you to talk about it and give us your thoughts on this dynamic, this hypothesis, whether you agree, disagree, whatever your thoughts are on it. I guess I did not realize my skill set of having both was that much of a purple unicorn. So I appreciate you pointing that out. I am the first and the only one to go to college in my family. And, and I'm also the youngest of 13. So when you have that many people that you have to communicate, varying personalities and ages and generations, you tend to have to become either invisible because everyone is bigger, older, more advanced than you or learn how to insert yourself. And that is what obviously helped me acquire these skills. Yep. I wish I was bilingual though. I wish. There was still time <laughs> if you wanted to do it. So interesting. And maybe you could talk a little bit about like how that be played out. Was it that you started taking STEM courses and you continued on and how did your ability to talk to family members about that where people asking you like what you were working on or at family yeah. gatherings or I'm just trying to get a sense from your own personal experience maybe how being first in family and then taking these advanced of course you're an engineer that involves a lot of I would say probably math and yeah. other things huh. and of course elements and levels of math that I studiously avoided but you took and you they have had to explain them of these things yeah. as you were going through your schooling. Yeah, so I would just say, so my background is a little chaotic, right? So I guess when people imagine families, they imagine traditional kind of families. But my 
Emily, I don't even think they even know what I majored in college. No one asked me about any of those things. I was not required during visitations or anything to explain. No one actually really cared. So I say all that to say I am the youngest of 13. And I feel as if by the time I was born, everyone was always already in their own group of things. Mm -hmm. I was ignored. However, being that I obviously was bright, I always had teachers take interest in me at school. They put me on this path of, oh, wow, you're good at math. You're good at science. And oh, you are motivated. So I would get opportunities to develop myself. And I understand a lot of school systems do what they call tracking. And I get now that I'm an adult, I understand what they were doing. And so I got opportunities that maybe some folks in my family didn't get when they were in school. So those were the beginning parts of learning how to articulate myself because I understood that opportunities came with that. Now, in my family, the sentiments was like, oh, she's smart. And that was really just it. <laughs> Don't really ask questions. So once I went to college, that was really just, oh, yeah, she's away at college. She's away at this fancy school. And I was pretty much on my own. So I just want to make it. I know there are different types of families in this world. And mine just did not fit into the, the American pie <laughs> box. I'm actually, and it's funny, I mentioned this on a podcast, a couple of them, because everyone's, oh, you're a little bit different. I'm actually a product of a marital affair. So I know that sounds wild, but there's nothing I'm embarrassed about. But I say that to say is that there are different dynamics that play into who people become. And I always say for me, it's not that I'm this special person who uh, who's just smarter than other people. I think I've been given opportunities, but a lot of it has to do with my genetics. My dad, who was different than my sibling's dad, he was a PhD in clinical psychology. He was a doctor in the army for a few decades. So he was a very accomplished man. And when I learned all this when I was 20, I actually met him when I was 20. I didn't know him my whole life. And then it was like, oh, this explains why I'm quote unquote different. In many ways, I mimic who he is. And so I always tell folks on, when they ask me, I'm like, who I am is not this, I'm not this magical person. It's a combination of, I would say, God and genetic. And there's nothing special I've done just born this way. Let me ask, that's real. thanks for sharing that. It, it's so important to get a full picture. You also mentioned something earlier, being the youngest and having to insert yourself was the way you yes. described it. And I haven't really thought about this question, even like a birth order. I, I don't really, people, some people really geek out on that. The middle mm -hmm. child is the this and the oldest is the that. I don't really keep track of that, which isn't to say it isn't true. It's just not something that like I have, I think, mind share enough to do. However, when you were talking about like you were the youngest of 13, you needed to insert yourself. You needed to be verbal. What I'm thinking is communication it can, with a diverse audience, like you were saying, all these other kids. And mm -hmm. like, how does a youngest get noticed, get their needs? Yeah. And you have to figure that out with different people, like different family, like siblings and stuff. And maybe there's different messaging for the the kid right above you in age and then the whatever it is. And I yes. was just thinking maybe there's a sophistication of communication that comes from that birth order that maybe mm. even is, is more than the first in their family and having to explain to parents. Of course, it can differ, it differs for different people, but I had never thought about this, the youngest in a big family and how maybe that impacted the communications abilities and really enhanced them, made them more sophisticated from a relatively young age. Yeah, I, I think there is a connection because I'm, a, I'm actually an introvert, so I'm a big observer of people. So being around people all the time, I paid attention and I paid attention to how people communicated and what the outcomes of it were. So I just mentioned, yes, I'm the youngest at 13, but my grandmother on my mom's side, my grandmother had 10 kids. So my mom is one of 10 and all of those 10 kids have eight to 10 kids themselves. And then those, my cousins, those cousins have kids and also there's literally 
hundreds of us. Uh -huh. So if we would go, if I would go to my grandmother's house growing up, she lived in a small town. My family is initially from a small town. And at one time, they were the only black family in that town. So everyone knew my family. And they spread out a little bit, but still around that town area. And most of the people that there are, we're, a lot of us are related because we have such a large family. And so mm -hmm. visiting there, I would just observe. I'm a big observer even now as an adult. And so I pay attention to how people are able to influence and really how they're able to navigate life. And most of it is done through how you communicate. And I really, I, I would just say at this stage of life, because I'm older now, I'm not that old, but I'm older now, is that it, I think back and reflect on these things to try to really understand who I am today and why I am who I am today. And so I have reflected on that and it has a lot to do with being a, an observer of hundreds of people around me <laughs> communicating and the outcomes uh, they got. Mm -hmm. I, I love that story. Thanks for sharing that, Monique. I want to ask you, because you raised this during our conversation on your show, Unpolished MBA, and we were talking about, you were talking about nonverbal cues, which is not something I focus so much on when you're talking, when you were talking about, it, I got it immediately. And some of the things you said were connecting with people by the tone of your voice and smiling more and things like that. And I wanted to ask you if you think in general, from your perspective, that women, in particular women, are expected to do more of that than men are. Absolutely. So being a woman in engineering, I believe that because we're in a male-dominated environment, you have different challenges, of course, than the men in the environment. So you learn all of these different skills on how to navigate it while in college, which is a great thing because when you get into the workforce, it's still predominantly men and it's predominantly white men. But now that's really, mm, now there's more diversity in there. It's some Asian and Indian more so as well, but it's still predominantly men, okay? And so I mentioned that the other like Asian cultures, they have different expectations as well. So they may not have the whole expectation of smiling and being this person, but in, in the American culture, women are expected to present themselves in a, a certain way, which involves smiling, being friendly, like all of those things are associated with being feminine. And what we learn in college, this is the interesting part, as I look back at so much, what we learn in college is none of the guys want to work with you. So as there's a lot of group projects and homework and things like that in any type of STEM degree. A lot of things are group effort, even in the workplace. So you got to learn how to work as a group. And if you don't exhibit some of those feminine qualities, really no one wants to work with you. Um, and, and if they, it can even get as shallow as if they don't find you attractive, they don't want you in their group. Like it's, it's that deep. And we don't really talk about it with them, with men, because it's one of those things that we just deal with behind the scenes. And in, in reality, we understand that we have some advantages as well by being feminine or being attractive or being so it's not all doom and gloom, but the unfortunate part is that it's still, it creates a divide. There is no equitable way to put it. We're judged based upon how we look and how we make people feel. That, that is a burden. You can say a burden is a blessing and a burden because it, it works well within our families, right? As if you're a mom or if you're, a sister or whatever, and your, your goal is to develop close relationships with people, if that's who you are as a person, it's expected of you. And if that's something that you want, people are receptive to it. 
when men try to do that, it might, it's more, wait a minute, what is he trying to do? It's more, we're more skeptical of those kind of behaviors. And women just have different expectations of how they operate in this world. And a lot of it is based upon your level of femininity and studying any type of STEM, particularly engineering, science. Yeah, all of the STEM, I can, <laughs> all of it. It is still considered less feminine than some of the other fields if you're a teacher. Even nursing is still STEM, but it's considered more feminine than a female engineer. Mm -hmm. And so those expectations are there, but we learn how to navigate it and become more aware of it while we're in college. And I can see how you started that process in your own family, All right? Yeah. So how you, by the time you got to college, you already had a, a strong grasp on this and now you were applying it maybe in a different environment because you were, were actually working in groups, yeah. like you pointed out. I, just for the record, no one's ever told me you need to smile more. They will tell you that. Yeah. So again, as an observer, so for me, as an observer of people and situations, I typically, like growing up, I was not a smiler. As I got into the workplace and I saw, and I've had other older women tell me that I needed to smile more in order to be sure that I was seen or promoted or whatever. Like sometimes mm -hmm. other women are part of this whole conspiracy, <laughs> I could say. And as a young woman, I would be like, are you serious? You're literally telling me to have some type of, some of them would actually encourage having some type of sex appeal in order to be successful in a workplace. And it's a horrible advice. But I can say for me, I would just try to blend into my background when I first started. I, when I first got out of, first of all, while I was in college, I worked for an engineering firm. I was in R&D. We worked, we created, designed and created RF power generators. Whoever is listening, <laughs> you may or may not know what that is, but it's, it's RF power generators that are used to power the machines that build semiconductors. So we were involved in the chip manufacturing um, industry. So it was very interesting stuff. And my background is electrical engineering. So it fell right in line with my interests as e even back then, it was just, it's just one of those things where you can be a really technical person and, and be smart. This world isn't, people are successful in this world just on being smart. If we're honest, if we're honest, how many unattractive, really successful people are there? This whole sex appeal thing is, it's a real thing. But when you're younger, I didn't really understand like what was going on. But as I observed, as I got older, I'm like, oh, that's what when I was 20 and the 55 year old woman was telling me I need to smile more. Now, like I've seen that, oh, those women that smiled got promoted. So when I first started in the in my industry, I wanted to blend. I would cut my hair. I would never let my hair be long. I would I would like not really wear lipstick or I wore pants suit versus pants versus skirts or dresses because I did not want to draw attention to the fact that I'm a woman or that I'm different. I wanted to be just respected for what I knew. And in most environments, I'm not saying it's not all environments, but in most environments, especially ones that I've been in, you can try, but it's not, it doesn't really work because people still realize or in their own way, they're always going to recognize that you're the woman in the room. And one of the things that many women complain about that come from STEM is how if you're in the room, you're in a meeting, you're the one that's expected to take notes. Right? I've experienced that as a young person in engineering. It's, oh, yeah, Monique will take the notes. Or you're the one that's expected to plan the office party. So those stereotypical roles are just assigned to the woman in the room. So I didn't want those things occurring, happening with me. And luckily that was only like very early on that something like that would happen. But nevertheless, it does. It does.
that gender bias is always there. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks for giving some specific examples too, to really shed light on this. I do remember when my sister was in high school, she was a valedictorian and this is back before, Ooh. before people had 4.5 GPAs and it was valedictorians. <laughs> It was before weighted GPAs, but she took all the hard, I'm the underachiever in the family. She took all the hard <laughs> classes, she went to Yale. But I do remember very vividly being with my parents and her in her bedroom, because the second, the, the student who was the second, the salutatorian who went to MIT, um, his father said something like, girls don't deserve to be valedictorian. Mm. Heard back, that's what we heard back. I don't know who picked that up, who either my sister heard that or my parents heard that or but, but this is a like one of those flashbulb moments for me remembering that and hearing that and just being so disgusted by that and not Do like you mind me asking how long ago that was like what year uh, in the 90s in the 80s? 80s yeah this okay. was in the 80s yeah so, it was in the mid 80s okay so that gives me some perspective i this world is just constantly evolving and, and changing some. So I was in high school in the late 90s, I guess you could say in the 90s. And when I graduated from high school, I graduated third in my class. And it's a long story because I actually missed the most of my sophomore year. So to be able to miss most of my sophomore year and still come back and graduate third out of a class of 200, 300 people was, I'm still shocked at it myself. But I can tell you, but again, that's God and genetics. Again, it's not that I'm this superhuman person, but when in our graduating class, it was all girls. And I think the, the first guy was number 10. All the rest of us that were one through nine were women and was, and no one kind of batted an eye at that. Yeah. So, That's yeah. a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And we're seeing more women in college now than men and we're yep. either in college or graduating from college or maybe both. So I want to talk about the workplace now because you touched on it a little bit and this translator role that we talked about a little bit on Unpolished MBA, where somebody who has strong communication skills like you and can read a room, understands interpersonal dynamics, and also the technical stuff and the engineering stuff and what an RF generator is and how it works, which I don't include myself in that category. Being able to exist in both worlds, which I view as just an extremely valuable person who can be in that from strictly a professional standpoint, of course, in an organization who can be in that role. And so you have played that role, as you described a little bit during our last conversation. And I'd like you to talk more about that and maybe some specific examples that stand out for you when you were in that role and how you managed it. I think that we're expected to be good communicators as women in STEM in the workplace. And I think that's a, a really tough thing because stereotypically people in STEM, men, women, whatever it is, we are accused of not being the best communicators. And there, it's actually, even though it's a stereotype, I always say that stereotypes doesn't mean it's not true. It just means it's not true for everybody, 100% of the people, but it's true for a lot of the people. And so that's where I'm at with this, right? And when we place those expectations on women to have those interpersonal skills and all that, it's not fair, right? Because a lot of us are wired the same way as the men who are not expected to be great communicators, but just be smart or be strong or whatever it is. So there's always these imbalances and biases. I totally get that. But just being aware of it. When we're talking about me having these different opportunities to be the translator, I would say probably my first, my second job. So I mentioned my first job working with RF power generators. My second one, one, I actually was engineer for Siemens and I built power plants around the U.S. So I was focused on building steam and gas turbines, new installations to add on to the infrastructure of the U.S. 
economy, right? <laughs> and the infrastructure for utilities and power generation, and electricity. In that, I would show up to on, on job sites. And of course, I'm the youngest one. I'm typically the only Black person. I'm definitely the only woman engineer that's on an entire job site. And not as one of the work, like I'm telling the workers what to do. And as a 22 year old, I'm communicating with someone who may be 60 and is the tradesman, a, a superintendent, and he is sharp. And in reality, I learn a lot from him and I would give him that respect, right? And for me, it's just about respecting people, understanding people, and just knowing that they're a person just like me. He put his pants on one leg at a time like I did. He may have more experience in some things and I have more experience in others. And respecting positions of understanding that there are positions of authority, there are positions of knowledge and skill. There are all these different things that people bring to the table. And so I think for me, it's always been a matter of respecting what other people bring to the table. And every person that I meet, I can learn something from. Every person, I look at every person as, what can I learn from this person? People feel like they learn a lot from me, but I feel as if I get so much from engaging with other people. So that's what makes me effective is because I level with them just human to human. It's not about I'm smarter than you, I'm better than you. It's more about how do we work together to get this done? I love that. Let me ask you a little bit more about that back and forth or similar professional relationships where, yeah, you're the youngest person. You're the only Black person. You're the only woman who's yeah. in a position of authority. And now you're talking to a white man who may have a daughter who is your age or maybe even older than you. And just like you point out, that person has specialized knowledge and experience. You have specialized knowledge and experience. The beginning of that kind of interaction, what you maybe have experienced, and if you're thinking about, it doesn't have to be the same person. I'm just talking about, I'm envisioning mm -hmm. a prototype person mm -hmm. or a persona because yep. I can see it in my mind. This person has done the work and yeah, you're the smart college kid and you've mm -hmm. you had a couple, maybe you had a job or two before, but I've been building these things or elements yep. of these things for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And so I could see, regardless, now I think about it, like as a, early in my career, I was a consultant right after grad school for PricewaterhouseCoopers. And I was in my mid twenties, a white guy going into organizations, sometimes the organizations were predominantly black or people of color. And I was just very sensitive to, I don't want to be like rolling in here and telling you how to do your job better. Cause first thing mm -hmm. is, I don't even know what your job is. You've been doing it. You know, better than I, and it starts this more collaborative approach, which you were talking about in a way. And I'm, of course I had other advantages that you probably didn't as a, as the only black person and also yep. as a woman and so young, but I'm thinking for purposes of that kind of dynamic that you've described, how did you manage it? Did it start out? How do you even initiate kind of, kind of professional <laughs> relationship? Because yeah. I could imagine it going a number of different ways. I'd love for you to share your experience of how it actually happens. Yeah. So if, if I were to finish your sentences, was it, let me add in the word awkward. And the answer for me is actually, it's none of it is awkward for me because I've been in all kinds of situations and going to a college with so many different types of people from like all over the world but one thing for sure is like all the people I went to college with I went to a private school I went to for my engineering degree I went to Rochester Institute of Technology RIT in New York and I was I grew up poor everybody around me had money everyone had parents that were helping them and they had different and I've scrapped and Struggle. I worked two jobs and I did a whole engineering degree with no like computer of my own, which meant that I did five years of college with getting work done by putting my schedule around when labs were open, being there all night, trying to fit things around my work schedule so I can get to the lab or asking friends to borrow their computer, like all that kind of stuff for five years just to be able to get out and do all these things. So I think that when I initially got on a job site, and I'll use the power plant job that I had, like post-graduation, when I worked for Siemens, 
I believe that it wasn't awkward for me, but initially when they, when I would show up, they would see me and be like, oh, because I got on a hard hat and work boots and a polo shirt like them. But my Khaki, hard hat khakis are no khakis, right? <laughs> I would wear jeans. I would wear jeans. But you also have to be careful as women on job sites with even showing your silhouette. So it's all of these little things that guys don't have to worry about. And I'm on a construction site. So they're like, whoa, who is this? And so to tamper all that down, um, I can't be the smiley, nice one initially. So I'm just strictly about business. And then they would ask me questions like within that first interaction, like, oh, where, where do you come from? Or, you know, where are you from? Like, oh, I'm from New York or went to school at so-and-so. Let me just explain to you that when we're building power plants around the country, they're typically in small town. So these small town people have never, ever seen anyone like me. They don't see Black people in positions of power doing that kind of work, having engineering degrees, all of this. So they were more intrigued than anything. So then again, I'm respectful of what they bring to the table. So it was just open up conversation. My first job site, I remember the guys kept asking me to go fishing because that was what they did in Louisiana. And they would invite me to lunch all the time and all of that. And so I think the mutual respect was there, but also this kind of curiosity about, wait, like in this small town, especially in Louisiana, and I love the people in Louisiana that are the true natives there, but Louisiana is a racist place, period. I don't care what it was. I got food poisoned four times while there because I would go into restaurants. I would show up and they would be like, can I help you? What are you doing here? And I would be like, yeah, I'd like a table for one because I'm going to a nice restaurant. I'm there for business. It's the on per diem. And they would sometimes sit me in the back, like just uh, all kind of weird things. I was food poisoned four times. But I say all that to say is that the people that I worked with, because they understood how Black people are typically treated in that area, they already knew that I must be a person with some type of resilience, something, in order to be where I was in that position. And I think they respected that, even though they may have had grandchildren my age. So I think it comes down to respect. What years are we talking about? I'm just thinking the, the, the yeah. point you made about the food poisoning and showing up to a restaurant and being asked what you wanted. Like, we, why were you even there? What years are we talking about, Money? Two th early 2000s. Recently, um, yeah. as far as that goes. It wasn't like, obviously, given your age, it had to be around that point, too. Your I mean, I've been age. called the N-word in these small towns, like just randomly, like people would yell out of their cars. That's what I was like. I was shocked to have those things happen to me, especially in Louisiana, because I had never been there before. And I was always known to, be, I've heard people for it to be a friendly kind of fun place. Mm -hmm. But I experienced some things that I still talk about now, just out of surprise that I can't believe that in the, two th in the early 2000s, that this was still the norm. That's beyond painful and what anyone should ever be exposed to, obviously. Thank you for being open about that. It's important for people to hear that. And on the job site, just as you point out, there was a respect for the hard work you must have put in to get there. And you are from a small town and you were in a small town. Maybe I mean, I'm talking about now just the, the job site situation where people knew you, got to know you professionally, and mm -hmm. the difference that made. And of course, your attitude towards them was respectful, professional, and resp yeah, understanding, professional. like you said. It's not but respectful. You're also in an authority position as well. So it's a nuanced thing. I, I just remember, I'm sure that, I don't think he came up with this, but President Obama said, so much harder or Michelle Obama or for women the, it's like Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. Ginger had to do everything Fred did, but backwards and in ends. Yep. If, yep. It makes it a million <laughs> times harder just to, to do it. To yes. Do it. Yes. Um, Indeed. Um, and so let's talk about now. Let's talk about what you're up to. You obviously have this awesome show on Polished MBA, like I said encourage people to listen. We'll have the link to the show in the podcast show notes. 
And, but share with listeners what else you're up to. So my career has evolved over the years. I started out as very highly technical types of roles. I went back to get my MBA in 2014, 13, around that time. And ever since then, I've been an entrepreneur. And I founded a tech startup, a software company from scratch. And I've done all types of things where I've been able to use just a combination of all the skills that I've accrued over the time. And so I have a consulting business called TPM Focus, where I basically use my engineering and technology skills combined with my my business skills and help tech startups and SMBs make money when they're trying to launch something new or launch into a new market. There are nuances to that that most of them are not familiar with. And the way I do things is really using more of the lean methodology so there isn't a lot of waste, right? And so we can get to a point where, okay, this is how we need to do things in order for it to to make money. And if it's not making money, how to make adjustments, how to experiment with things. And so I really love that aspect of my work because... I get to see the impact with up and coming like new things and then companies that are really creating the future. And so that that's part of my work. And I really enjoy it. I maybe two years ago, my my family, I call it my husband and I and other some other folks that I have in my network, we started an acquisition company where I'm actually acquiring small businesses. And it's one of those things where I know how the sausage is made. And so I know what to look for because I'm behind the scenes with a lot of these companies. And so I just, I'm at this phase of my career, I'm focusing on helping people have an impact and just doing it through business and technology. I'm staying busy. I love it. I'm sure that you are. As we wrap up, Monique, let me ask you for advice that you would give to others now earlier in their career, thinking whether it's in science, tech, engineering, maybe thinking back to the 22-year-old you with the hard hat, the polo, and on the job site, things that you've learned by experience. You've also have this intuition on how to genuinely, authentically relate to people and a lot of people and people generally need more of that, I think, regardless of field. Mm -hmm. So to be successful, to move from maybe a technical focused job in an organization to within the same organization, even to more of a decision-making management role where the technical piece is taken for granted. And now there are all these other skills, but to get really promoted you need to have these other this other component of your professional persona. Any advice that you would share with listeners in this regard? The theme of your podcast and really of your consulting company as well, with folks really knowing how to communicate and being able to connect with people is important. So I'm of the mindset in my especially in my in my company is how do we connect that to make money, provide ac enterprise value, economic value. Because if being honest, this country, this world, it's all about capitalism, making money, and people look at value in dollars and cents. And I, I don't think, especially as folks in STEM, we never think about money. And this is the thing with most of the founders that I work with that are like technology folks or STEM folks. I'm like, hey, I know I'm you. We love to create. We love all these cool things. And I still got a soldering iron and my breadboard and all this <laughs> stuff that I flew around with in my yeah. office here. And it's like, that's all fun. That's all great. I know we know how to create, but how does this make money? Because no one, everyone ignores us if we're not making the money. And so I really advise, especially young folks, I get friends in my network send their children to me all the time, especially their daughters. And be like, oh, I think you might want to talk to, to Miss Monique because she's done certain things that might be helpful to you. And she'll be honest about her experience. She will be honest about her experience. So I tell most of the young people, I'm like, two things. 
when we talk about on this podcast, communication and connection, I think all people, young people especially, need to learn how to sell. You need to learn how to sell because you're constantly selling anyways, whether it's yourself to get a job, if you're trying to convince someone to help you with something, influencing people, all of that are basically renditions of sales. When you're in a position uh, at man of managing a team or you have the authority to hire people, that's selling the company. That's selling to get someone to join your vision, your mission, your goal. So that's number one. My daughter will be going to college this fall. And there are two things that my kids knew since they were little. They're mandated to do the summer before going to college. Two things. They, they need to take a real estate class because that's typically the largest expense they'll ever have in their lives outside of college education. So you true. have to understand real estate. You don't have to get licensed. I'm licensed and I have been for a couple decades. So you need to understand how this world works when it comes to that. And secondly, you must take a sales class. So sales and sales is just a natural part of how we get things done here. And we're able to provide value for ourselves and for other people. Once you really understand that concept, even if you're not an entrepreneur and you work for a company, you need to understand how they make money and how what you do makes them money. If you don't know that, you're at risk. It's so easy to lay off the people that don't make the company money. They look at everything as a cost in reality. But if you're the one bringing ideas, even if that's not your job to bring ideas on how they can make more money or how they can enter new markets or how customers uh, may feel about the product or whatever, if you're willing to do even research with their customers, make some phone calls and make sure customers are successful, even though you're the engineer, right? If you're willing to do that, you are a value add. And so understand where you fit into this engine of how people make money. And it's, it's no other way. I wish, I really wish people were honest with young people about how this world really works. And I am. So I make it my mission to just sh share what I know for sure. And that's what I know for sure. And those will be the last words of the episode. They're so powerful and so important. I also have an 18-year-old who will be starting university in the fall. We'll talk offline about different lessons and <laughs> things. I haven't mentioned the real estate course and sales course to him yet. Very good stuff. Monique Mills, wonderful. The whole range of our conversation, beginning with your show on Unpolished MBA, we had a chance to start our conversation and then this continuation, and I hope it leads to other dialogue moving forward. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And listeners, thanks for being here on this episode of When Science Speaks, and I hope you'll be back for the next episode of When Science Speaks.